media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. Oh, and we've got another lovely Friday here, and... Uh interesting week in the markets and uh, i'm looking forward to the weekend how about you it's going to be a great weekend because we're celebrating my wife's birthday oh terrific terrific we have listener questions our first one comes from justin in berkeley people wax poetic when they speak about paul volcker and his work at the fed in the mid 80s but was he just following the natural trend of larger or i should say longer private rates anyway does a central bank look to see where the wind is blowing and goes in that direction to maintain the kabuki theater that they have control over the economy? Justin, kabuki theater, that is so good. Yeah, uh, actually, I was, of course, in the investment business in 1980 when that super cycle commodity bull market completed. And then afterwards reviewed it and oh, even when Volker, I guess, passed away, I wrote a, about a thousand word essay on it. And, uh, if one takes, now here's the story on Volker that he single-handedly ended inflation by raising the Fed, uh, rate, the administered rates. Now, if you go back in history, before there were central banks, or even during the period when central banks were responsible, you'd have a huge war, you'd have a huge commodity boom, and interest rates would go up. It happens. And then once the uh, the boom is over, uh, inter- uh, commodities crash and interest rates go down. But specifically, uh, later on, I took a look at M2 money supply, through the late 70s and through 80, 81, 82. And there was no change in the growth of the money supply. So essentially, the Fed really didn't tighten. Uh, The financial markets tightened. So that then was a huge commodity boom and uh, particularly focused upon the uh, gold with the attempt at the Hunt brothers on the silver corner. So it got very exciting. But it was, uh, the previous big boom in commodities was with the, with the world, First World War. The commodities went straight up to 1980, or sorry, to 1920. And then, and then the U.S. rate of, uh, inflation got up to 22%. And then the commodities crashed. And the rate of inflation in the U.S. got down to something like min- minus 14%. So the Fed spent the 20s worrying about inflation. So uh, the uh, point being is that there have been a number of huge commodity booms and crashes, and they end on their own. And Volcker had very little to do with it except try to look like he was in charge. I'm going to get that essay out and we'll, we'll send it to our subscribers. Um, then the other part of the question is that, uh, does the central bank look to see where the wind is blowing and goes in that direction to maintain the kabuki theater? Yeah, all they can do is, is pretend that they have control of the economy. And, uh, that's all they can do. And, These business cycles are natural, and a great financial bubble is also natural, as is the subsequent uh, contraction, which we are in now. Thanks a lot for the question. 
Bob, my question is, do you have to raise interest rates in this uh, high leveraged uh, market uh, where people are carrying already very high debt loads? I mean, the Fed says they're going to keep raising rates until there's blood in the streets. Yeah, well, the reason why the Fed is raising interest rates is because the T-bill rate has been going up, the mar- and that's set by market rate market forces. And I've got uh, studies I've done in the past that the Fed follows the T-bill rate by three or four months, maybe five months. But at any rate, the reason why the Fed is raising its rates is because market rates of interest are going up. And probably it would take three or four months before the Fed lowers its rate following the decline in, say, three-month or six-month treasury bill rates, which I think is close to happening. The T-bill rate is getting very close to heading down. So, no, the Fed uh, the Fed is, uh, let's say, kabuki theater. A question from Michael. It's a multi-parter, so let's uh, get into the first part. From Michael, hi, Jim and Bob. Wow, those gold mining stocks and silver are approaching the March 2020 lows fairly quickly. Bob, is it time yet to start accumulating, or will a meaningful low in the precious metal sector be seen later this year or in 2023? Okay, good good question, yeah. The irony with the gold stocks is that uh, in the final leg of a great bubble, uh, they underperform. And then uh, because gold's a real price uh, and it goes down. And then once you get the, the contraction starting, selling liquidity crisis in the big market takes the gold stairs down. So this is what's happened here now. Uh, the Probably the long bear market for gold since the gold sector since 2011 is completing. And uh, I think that the, the market has to clear itself and... Uh, One of the things about it is that the next bull market for gold will be outstanding. And I think that technically we will be able to catch the bottom as it occurs sometime over the next six to eight weeks. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it'll be a great opportunity. And then the next part of the question. Also, how will the European oil embargo with Russia end? Apparently, the Chinese government is reselling Russian liquefied natural gas to the European Union at a huge markup. Also, President Biden decided to sell a huge amount of the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve to China, not the EU. This all seems crazy to me, Bob. I'm confused. What's going on here? Oh, they are absolutely crazy. Uh, it's an example of policymakers with too much power. And you've had the long promotion about global warming. Therefore, you're going to have milder winters, right? And then they then uh, decide that you have to have wind and solar energy, which are interruptible, and you don't want coal, natural gas, or oil, heating oil. And so they turn against that. And when there is no way that you can generate enough uh, capacity out of uh, windmills and and solar cells. As a matter of fact, those two methods, it costs more energy to build a wind turbine than you can get out of its lifetime. So it's absolute madness. And then when you had the uh, the threat to the nuclear plant, uh, plant in Japan with that tsunami, then everybody went bonkers and tried to shut down nuclear. So the politics uh, took and shut down reliable energy sources and efficient energy sources and then put in unreliable windmills and solar. Now, in the 1980s, President Reagan advised Europeans a number of times not to get dependent upon Russian oil and gas supplies. But because oil and gas was was uh, evil in northern Europe, they then accepted deliveries of those things from Russia. So, uh, And look, at, at the time, you could say that they were absolutely insane. And uh, looking back on it, 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 that has been confirmed because they have a horrendous crisis that price of natural gas in Europe and in London has gone straight up. But my guess is that the... The capacity in Europe, storage capacity in Europe and in, in England 
is at the limit, so they can't buy anymore. So the prices of natural gas in those two countries comes down rather sharply. And of course, this is where Putin was timed to say he's going to really turn off the taps. You can't deliver to a system that's already full of capacity. So, and of course, it won't be enough. And a while ago, I came across a chart, believe it or not, of the price of firewood in Germany. I think it started in 2006, so it was a sideways up and down with the season annually, and then all of a sudden straight up. So the, and then we, uh, you know, it's it is the result of policymakers two things: going crazy, and two, having the power to impose their crazy ideas upon the economy and upon uh, the social fabric. But I think that uh, this winter will, <laughs> and if you go into uh, this post-bubble contraction gets a little worse, uh, the public is going to be in the mood to reform a lot of this nonsense. And, and indeed, it's happening already. They're bringing on old coal production and uh, trying to get some gas going, although I saw the other day that Scotland re- refused to allow more natural gas drilling. So, But give them a hard winter. They'll smarten up a little, I think. But, yeah, it all seems crazy, uh, which, Michael, you wrote, and uh, that's true. And uh, just a moment of madness. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob uh, we now have some headlines that caught your eye. And uh, let's stick with uh, European energy for a second. Headline, Polish homeowners line up for days to buy coal ahead of winter. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine lining up for days? That means you'd have to have a member of your family there sleeping overnight. But then it reminds back of uh, in, the, in the former Soviet Union where... Russians in any city w- would always carry a little string grocery shopping bag with them. And if they saw a lineup, they'd say, oh, there must be something there to buy. So they'd get in the lineup not knowing what was ahead of them in order to buy what was possibly available. And then maybe by the time they got to the head of the line, it would run out. So that, was that of course, was centralized communist planning. It just doesn't work. But here you are. Uh, yeah. Put yourself as the head of a family somewhere in Poland, and uh, they get some winter there. And uh, what are you going to do? You have to go through the nonsense, mainly because the central planners have gone crazy. Headline, Goldman Sachs says, buy commodities, worry about recession later. <laughs> yeah, at least they're recognizing that a recession is possible. But uh, it looks like uh, commodities uh, have accomplished some terrific uh Technical excess is on the upside, and uh, the correction has started, and I think uh, that uh, over the next few months, they can get pretty hard, hit pretty hard. I mean, this week, uh, crude oil was hit pretty hard through most of the week. Um, and uh, so this is one of the problems here, is that you've had most this year, the old inflation bugs are in full order, because you had exceptional events uh, like shutting down shipments and production of grain in uh, Ukraine, also shipments of fertilizer. And uh, from time to time, China shuts down whole, you know, 30 million sized cities. So there's still interruptions going on from the government side. But I think the financial markets, as usual, see through this. And uh, with the recession, and as I mentioned, that's tied to the yield curve inverting. So with the recession, uh, amazing things will happen. Uh, the demand will fall, and uh, all of a sudden, supplies will start coming out. Uh, there could be tightness and shortages in the grain market uh, over the next while. But I think the big rush in, in commodities and the uh, the huge uh, enthusiasm of the inflationist is all in the market, and it's vulnerable to the next recession which could have started already and it's also vulnerable to the continuing uptrend in the u.s dollar the dx continues firm and is looking good so there uh, there's problems ahead for commodities 
Headline, China's property market slipped into severe depression. Yeah, and that, that uh, Jim, was from the Wall Street Journal, which is not a particularly uh, sensational reporting, but there it is. Uh, the, the, their property market is in a depression. And that's worth reviewing. Uh, the uh, the post bubble contraction, as I've called it, first became evident in March of 2021 when uh, it was reported in Argentina and Turkey that their central bank had suddenly run out of reserves. So it was the classic financial crisis and slowing of the economy. And then that summer, it was in China, and that's a huge economy, and it's in contraction. And then now Russia with the sanctions and stuff like that. So so the world is, and including the U.S., because you've had first two quarters of the year at negative GDP growth, which is an old definition of a recession, but it's not severe yet. This may be discovered uh, in the next month or so. So, Headline. Everyone is a landlord. Small-time investors snap up out-of-state properties. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, also, when I'm driving around the car, I often have the news radio station on, and somebody's got a commercial about you as an individual uh, landlord with a property that you're trying to rent out. You can join into this website, and they can provide all the services for you, like managing the property and all that stuff. So when you've got uh, pros in the business setting up uh, a system to assist uh, individuals who are uh, in the property, in the residential real estate market, that's a sign. And then you got this one where uh, uh, it's happening. Uh, the uh, or, uh, Small investors are excited about property. And gosh, it goes back to, oh, the 80s when I knew some guys uh, in Vancouver here who were active in real estate, and they were going to Atlanta to speculate in real estate there, and I could never understand it. And then, of course, in Vancouver, turns out to be the hottest, one of the hottest properties markets in the world, and of course, I got no idea what happened to Atlanta, but, you know, probably went up, but this was the case of small individuals heading out to somewhere else to buy property and of course that was also the case with in the mid 1920s when uh, property in florida became the rage oh my god they put in a there was a new railroad that went from the east coast all the way down to uh, florida and you had all this wonderful beachfront property and uh, very speculative action and then i think in 1927 it crashed or began to crash and then there was a a tremendous storm that did a lot of damage. So that then failed. So the property markets are highly speculative and are vulnerable to uh, the, the post-bubble contraction as it gets worse. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, hey, Jim. Good to be with you, and we we'll look forward to next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. If you have any questions for Bob, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.